Listening to the Spiritual Bazaar, this is A, and this is an anonymous audio cast by someone on the road to recovery while exploring spiritual paths and the mystery of life. Whatever that may be. But I do have a mystery, and that's my own mind. And I'll get into that for in a little bit. But I just want to take a moment to ask you to send out all your prayers and thoughts to all the victims, those including that have survived of the Orlando massacre that occurred and to um, our LGBT friends out there um, I really don't have anything else to say except for that this happened yesterday I don't know when you'll hear this podcast but um, it really shocked me and and stopped me in, in my tracks So if you could send your love out to all those people who are suffering, that would be great. Okay. So I'm going to pick up reading a journal entry from um, day three at the New Direction Rehab. It was cooler and overcast for the first half of the day. A mood that stayed with me even after the sun came out and brightened the rolling hills and mountains that surround us. Last night, it seems... The geese that were guarding their eggs in a red box house across the pond had been invaded by what is generally believed coyotes, and we can hear them howling tonight. The geese look sad and lost, a feeling I shared. The difference is that their grief was caused by an external attack, whereas mine was caused by an internal attack. My addictive mind was laying in wait for the right moment, and had me pinned before I even went out. It is cunning and baffling. Your own good intentions and desires are undermined by something that you wish was never there. My own will has been unable to eradicate it, delete it, clear it out, the enemy in my mind. But I can't do it on my own. I am incapable of simply choosing to change of my own will, something most people simply don't understand. But nor do I. I'm having a hard time accepting that my addiction will always be a part of me. Perhaps it will go quiet. Perhaps it will always lay in wait. I have to learn to manage it if it does. And I have to assume it will. Going inside my mind is like going into a six-dimension labyrinth. Who does really know their mind? Only mine and others like me have a ferocious, transmuting, mythical-like beast running through the labyrinth, pulling levers to secret doors and trap doors while disguising itself however it will in the good, the bad, and the ugly. If I don't know myself, how do I know which path to take? Self-exploration. The mind is a funny thing. Can I ever really know myself? What is the self? You know, I've heard it broken down in ways that, just like matter, matter can be broken down into smaller components and smaller components and smaller components and smaller components. And then what are you left with? And I think the mind is very similar. I can sit here and try to break it down and try to break it down and try to break it down. And what am I left with? How can I even know what the self is? So in a sense, and I think this is uplifting, the self is infinite. Broken down to the tiniest level, to the smallest wave particle. What the hell is the mind? I don't know. I do know that I have a sense of who I am at the deepest core of me. I know that love is an extremely important part of that. But I also know what it is I want for other people. 
I don't want other per- people to be hated, to be hurt. I don't want this for myself either. But how does that make me me? Because a lot of other people, including yourself, probably feel the same way. So my mind runs away. And I think it runs away as I try to grab it, as I try to take hold of it, rather than letting go. I can say a miracle has happened. As of uh, recently, normally I would go into work and when I'm at work, I would get this crazy neurotic energy that would just kind of propel me through work. And I think it's because I don't want to think about the fact that I'm at a place that I don't want to be at. And the work itself is utterly conducive to neurotic thinking and behavior, especially if you're susceptible to it. You know, for me, the business I'm in is a service business. And your job is to constantly please people for hours on end, sometimes 10, 15 hour days. And it's hard to keep a good center of your mind when you're constantly running around in your mind and actually physically. And you're saying to people, okay, I need a barbecue sauce for this. I need to go to that. I need to get a coffee. Oh, we don't have coffee. Oh, milkshake. What kind of milkshake do you want? And then you go up to the table and then the table is saying, oh, I'm ready, but you're not really ready. You want to, want to take the order, but you can't take the order because they keep asking you questions. And then when they say, okay, we're ready, then they ask you another question. In the meantime, you have 500 other things going on at the same time. You have another table over there waving you down. They're really anxious. They just got in there. They haven't even had a chance to look at the menu, but they want to ask you questions. In the meantime, you have 500 things going on in the back of your mind. You have other servers that need help and you need to help them because you all help each other. Food's not coming out on time. I'm sorry. The food's not going to be out on time. I apologize. I'll do whatever I can to make you happy. Blah, 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 blah. And then you go up to another table and that table is taking forever. In the meantime, you still have 500 things on your list of things that you need to do and you're constantly going. And then you run into the table and then you go to help somebody else. But then that table needs something else that you didn't expect. So then from there, you got to go run back, help someone else, grab something, bring it back to the table. And then your other table is upset that you're not helping them, but really you're helping another table. It's all in the cause of service. And then you have people that come in and they're just mean. And they just want to take out all their problems on you. When you're serving, you really do see the worst in people. In the little ways. And I'm the last person to be a therapist for you when you come into the restaurant. My job is to serve you, make it a pleasant experience. But if you come in and you're dumping all your baggage and your attitude on me, what do I do with that? And it's not just you, it's the other person over there too. And then at the same time, you've got a table that's really nice to you and you're like, thank goodness. And what a relief that someone's actually not neutral, but actually kind and understanding and it doesn't happen a lot but it does happen and it really helps but this kind of behavior and this kind of thinking is going on for hours and what happened is I used to take that and when I would leave the restaurant it would take hours after I left the restaurant for that energy to come down but now I I literally walk out the door and I'm calm. It, It just all fades away. And there's no doubt in my mind that it's related to my working a spiritual program every day. And I don't believe in a God with a capital G, a creator per se, But I do pray to the universe. And I do ask for help. And I do put intentions out there. And it's paying off. I... I don't know if it's just the repetition of saying the words and asking for help that affects the subconscious but I really feel like there's actually more to it than that 
Now I may not really know myself. I may not truly know what the core of my being is. And I don't even know if it's possible to get there. But what I do know are the behaviors that I don't like. Destructive, self-destructive behaviors. And I do know that they're changing. And they've been changing since I've put a belief into something greater than myself. I had an interesting conversation this morning about atheism. And um, so if you're an atheist, you don't believe in a God, you don't believe in a creator. And you don't believe in a dogmatic religion. But if you're atheist, you can still be spiritual. But if you believe in some sort of energy, some sort of consciousness that exists outside of what science has yet to show us, or may never show us, if you believe in that, can you still be an atheist, or does that put you as an agnostic? I'd love to hear your feedback on that. Digging up the past can be helpful, but it doesn't really help you know who you are. I think the only way I can learn to help to know myself is to take steps moving forward. I think the only thing I can do with the past and my past actions, good or bad, is learn what it is that I don't like about myself and work on making those changes. But it will never tell me who I really am. I can never look in the past and go, that's who I am. Because five years ago, ten years ago, twenty years ago, six months ago, it's gone. It's gone. The only person that I am is me right now. And, um, In my active, dry drunk, my sort of torturous periods of of sobriety, or even better periods of sobriety, I was still obsessing on the past. Um, Even so far as going to listening to listening to music from a time period that I felt good in or I felt better in. And I was trying to evoke that person, that sense of who I am in this place, or just just that sense of feeling good. And you know, it, it can help a little bit. It can it can bring up some of that positive energy, but it's it's still fleeting. You know, when you stop listening to the music. But I, I mean, I really tried to to sort of re-invoke where I was in a certain place in time in the past and I could tell you it does not work not for me no matter how hard I tried it does not work so I need to let go of the past but for the sake of my sobriety I cannot forget I cannot forget what I've done and I cannot forget the worst of those experiences when I was using I have to think through. If I get a thought that could be self-destructive, whether it's about using or whether it's just a behavior that I've uh, developed, a habitual behavior that I've developed, I have to stop myself and think through it. I'm getting better at it. Significantly better. But I still have these little moments. For instance, I was at work and this guy was passing by it's a very tight space getting to the bathroom and with his backpack slammed one of the servers in the back as he did that he said excuse me as he's passing by she called him out on it confronted him and I did nothing I just sat there and let it happen and then afterwards as he was a customer after that tension I tried to smooth it over by talking to him nicely and shortly after that, I immediately regretted my actions because one, it was a fear-based action. 
because I didn't want to say anything that would get an email sent to corporate and people get fired when emails get sent to corporate but really his behavior was was extraordinarily rude and well anyway you don't say excuse me while you're actually in the act of um <laughs> being rude or you know actually like, you know hurting somebody it it doesn't count you can't just say well i said excuse me well, no you have to say excuse me let someone know you're passing by be cautious and careful and pass by and don't hit me in the head with your backpack and i think that's a metaphor <laughs> for a lot of things in life um that actually might be a metaphor for sobriety but um yeah i regretted that i didn't say anything um because it was a fear-based reservation on my part and um you know living in a city you, those kind of things happen every day you know when i was in rehab in a much more rural area all those little things that can get under your skin all day long aren't there quite as much they they really aren't but in the city you have to deal with that every single day and if you're susceptible to being neurotic and not being comfortable in your mind you're you're not going to be able to handle those little instances very well and that just builds up and builds up and builds up and then you start feeling like crap you start feeling guilty why didn't i do this why didn't i react that way or you start getting resentments and anger at people for behaving certain ways um and on a small scale i used to hate people who walked slow in the city and i was walking behind them i used to hate that but now since i've been in recovery i've actually slowed down my walking and it feels really good and now i'm looking at those people and going oh okay i, I get it there's no reason for me to work myself into a nervous state to get to a job or to get to the train or to meet somebody at the store or whatever it is because in the long run I'm losing I'm convincing myself that I'm saving so much time by speed walking or walking twice the speed and uh, what I'm losing in trade of, of time is peace of mind peace of mind there we are back to the mind again so I don't really know what the self is but I do know what it feels like to be centered and I think that might be the best that I could ever know I think that when I'm centered and I'm thinking clearly and and when I say thinking clearly it it means calmly and that means I'm not getting myself worked up and I'm not justifying my frustrations and my anger and my emotion that becomes destructive and I have to wonder the person who carried out this mass murder in, in Pulse in Orlando, I have to I have to think that they did not have a calm mind. They were not centered, no matter what religion they may have believed in. As of now, it's believed that his religion was that of Islam, but it doesn't matter. Because whatever was going inside his head, it was his way of living on a daily basis that caused his mind, plus whatever mental illness he may or may not have had, caused his mind to be unsteady and insecure and fearful 
and hateful. And you can use any, well, you can use some religions to justify that behavior. And that's why I'm not big on dogma. I think it can be very dangerous. That said, of course, there are plenty of loving, kind, beautiful people that believe in religions of dogma. But are they more susceptible? Are some individuals more susceptible because they are already unstable? More susceptible to finding whatever they need to in that religion to justify their actions. And I think we all do that to some degree. I can use my own ethics. I can use my own moral code to justify directing anger at that person or at to other people for whatever it is. But in the end, where does that get me? Everybody is different. Everybody has a different path. We all have our different weaknesses. But for me, when I do that, I take myself down and I take others down with me. And I'm really, really upset about what happened. Um, so what I know for today is that love has to come first. It really does. It has to be the center of your intentions. Because when love becomes the center of your intentions, everything else is questioned. All your actions are questioned and held up against the concept of loving everyone and loving this universe that we are in. So that said, as flaky as this may sound, I love you all, good or bad, and maybe when we can learn to love ourselves, then maybe we'll get to know ourselves. This is A with the Spiritual Bazaar. If you have any feedback or comments, you can go to the website at spiritualbazaar.com, send me an email, or you can go to the Instagram page and leave a comment there. Be well, everyone. Let the mystery take you. Peace and love. Yes.